Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The New Age of Turbo Machinery. I'm Drew Robb, the Editor-in-Chief of Turbo Machinery International Magazine. I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this webcast presented by Turbo Machinery International and sponsored by Velo3D. I'd like to share a statement from our sponsor. Velo3D provides end-to-end metal 3D printing solutions for mission-critical parts in the space, transportation, and energy industries. Unlike conventional metal 3D printing solutions or traditional manufacturing methods, Velo3D helps design engineers build the complex parts they need without compromising their design or part quality. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined by Matt Koresh and Jose Luis Cordova. Matt is a technical business development account manager at Velo3D and specializes in helping companies get the most out of Velo3D capabilities for their end part applications. He started his career in backup power generation before moving to commercial aviation where he worked on high pressure turbine blade design. Matt started working with additive manufacturing in 2017 and has experience with several disciplines, including laser powder bed fusion, electron beam melting, and binder jetting. Matt's previous roles include engineering responsibilities at GE Aviation and Caterpillar. Jose Luis Cordova is VP of Engineering at Mohawk Innovative Technology, Inc., Mai Tai where he heads the Turbo Machinery Design Team. He received a degree in Mechanical Electrical Engineering from the University Nacional Automa, Automata at De Mexico and both MS and PhD in Mechanical Engineering Science from the University of California at Berkeley. His background spans multiple fields, including combustion, fluid and mechanics, heat transfer, thermodynamics, and applied engineering mathematics. During his tenure at MITI, Dr. Cordova has collaborated on the design of multiple engines, including gas turbine engines, turbo generators, compressors, and turbochargers. His current focus is on blowers for solid oxide fuel cell power plants and supercritical CO2 turbo machinery for green energy and he is leading MITI's incorporation of 3D printing technology into its machinery integration workflow. Thank you for joining us today. Please get us started, Matt. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having us on today. Really appreciate it. I think it's going to be a good discussion. Um, before I get kind of too deep into the present, at least the beginning of the presentation, I want to draw everyone's attention to kind of right side of your screen. There's a couple attachments in there. Um, one of them brand new released uh, from Velo is an ebook. Um, that's a, um, a good description, if you will, of five uh, major crucial core components where we've given a good description of how we transform that design and, and manufacturing process using the Velo technology. So take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, Jose is also going to touch on one of the other ones in there, but uh, I'll let him do that, and uh, I'll jump into kind of the rest of the presentation here. So Velo3D, um, what we offer is an advanced end-to-end -end metal solution, metal additive manufacturing solution, um, not just a metal 3D printer. 
And so a little bit about us, founded back in 2014 by Benny, um, who is a physicist by education, so very technical and, and driven man. Um, towards the end, so September of last year, we became a public company listed um, on the New York Stock Exchange. And what we really, uh, really strive for and are, are really good at is um, creating these complex, high value, high end metal components where um, we're trying to deliver you the parts that you, you need, you want, um, and the functional requirements of your design requires, not so much what the manufacturing technique dictates. Um, in terms of what we offer, so the hardware piece, kind of the, the tangible piece of our solution is the Sapphire Printer Family. Um, and we name it a printer family for a reason in that uh, the processes that we run across the entire family are the same. Um, so we keep the, the hardware, the fundamental like optical trains and things like that as close um, to each other throughout the different printers as possible. So that again, we are repeatable and scalable. So on the smaller end, uh, our traditional Sapphire is a 315 millimeter diameter build plate, and that extends to 400 millimeters in the Z direction, and that has two one kilowatt lasers. Um, they stitch across the build plate and have capability of creating a part that full 315 millimeter size. We then take that exact same platform and extend the Z height uh, to a full mil, uh, full meter, so a thousand millimeters. Um, everything else about the machine remains exactly the same. So functionally, they are the same machine with just extended build height. Um, and then as of late last year, we've just started shipping our Sapphire XC system. And so pretty big milestone for us. It's a increase in size to 600 millimeters in diameter, 550 millimeters in the Z direction, and it runs eight one kilowatt lasers. So significant increase in build volume and also significant increase in laser power. Um, therefore, overall productivity of the machines uh, has significantly increased. With that being said, having multiple lasers on a single system, uh, the first thing most people think of with experience in AM is laser alignment. So all these machines are equipped with uh, kind of automated calibrations, specifically laser alignment calibrations, not only prior to um, each build, but also um, also during the build. Uh, so every single layer, we check the positional location of the lasers and make sure that it's not drifting and staying well within alignment. Uh, all of our processes today run at a standard 50 micron uh, layer thickness. And again, I mentioned calibration. So we've come into the mindset uh, in, the, in the AM world, if you will, um, that the, the success of the process and the success of the technology is very much uh, reliant upon how well your machines are running and how well they're calibrated. And so from kind of the outset, integrating automated calibrations into our machine where you're not requiring a, a third party field service engineer or third party hardware, um, external hardware to calibrate your machine, which allows you to calibrate it well, we recommend once a week, but uh, we see many customers uh, calibrating before every single build. Keeps your builds well within spec and then also burns down any risk you have in your supply chain. If you're running for an extended period of time, a month, three months, six months, uh, prior to an additional calibration of having a lot of parts that are then uh, kind of run at risk and uh, suspect if your calibration does fall out. And then lastly, we have a significant amount of in-situ monitoring, so approximately a thousand different sensors measuring all kinds of data throughout the build. And we also distill and report that data back out to you to understand the health of your build uh, during the entire process. What, with that offering and kind of bringing all that together as a single system and a single solution, we're able to create a lot of components that um, quite frankly, any other AM systems just can't do. Um, without requiring support structures on low, uh, low angle features like shrouded impellers and things like that, very thin, um, very fragile uh, features like heat exchanger fins, 
uh, micro turbines where very complex internal passages with again combining like low angle surfaces and um, low angle fins and things like that where traditionally or even in the AM world you'd have an assembly or um, a bunch of internal support structures which would then require removal um, is no longer necessary and then something that's maybe not quite as intuitive or obvious but the the scalability and the reliability of the system by running on the uh, the same process parameters and um, running on the automated calibrations and uh, having all the machines built with the same hardware allows you to take that single build file and then uh, scale it out or send it out to a network of printers um, where you can then expect the exact same recipe to be used from the print file and therefore the exact same uh, product to be produced and come out of the printer. Um, so a little bit, I should say, quite different from uh, the, the rest of the AM world today. Some of the customers, just a very small kind of glimpse into the customers you work with. Uh, so early on, we did a lot of work with space companies. Um, and quite frankly, because there's a lot of very expensive, high value, high complexity components there, and then branching out into aerospace, um, starting to make some traction in oil and gas industry where uh, there's a lot of turbo machinery and flow control valves and really finding different pieces of value um, in all these different industries where uh, it's starting to not just be that the geometric freedom uh, is the kind of the only reason to use Velo, but really getting into the supply chain and the process monitoring and the part quality and things like that has allowed us to break in to some of these other um, industries that are out there. In terms of materials that we offer today, so we're constantly developing more materials, but um, list at the top there shows the materials we have developed. And when we say a, a developed material, we mean when you see a part that was printed on Velo, um, the a developed material means you can reproduce that on a system, um, regardless of who owns it, where it's operated. So we create the entire process parameter set to allow you to create the components you need. Uh, so you don't need to be a AM expert, a welding, micro welding expert, materials expert to take our system and then go develop your own processes. It comes right out of the gate with the ability to go create these geometries. Um, in addition to that, we do some basic uh, material properties, uh, material characterization, so things like tensiles and yield strengths, um, thermal conductivity for copper. Uh, so uh, a basic suite of those to start. And then as we work with customers and understand where the needs and the values are for each of the materials, we'll go after, for example, like high temperature fatigue or crack growth, things like that. And the idea is to create this suite of materials that's more or less off the shelf ready to go for designs without having to have customers go do their own testing and characterization. So as we continue to build this uh, library, this material um, portfolio, uh, we'll get stronger and stronger in our offerings. Um, so I mentioned GRCOP, we had just released that material. So it's a uh, kind of high temperature NASA alloy for originally designed for um, rocket thrust chambers. So there's a lot of interest out there in the space world for that alloy, uh, but really good for any kind of actively cooled combustion um, type applications. We've also got Inconel 718 and 625, Titanium 64, a couple grades of that, Aluminum F357, Hastelloy X and Hastelloy C22, Scal Malloy, which is think of like a a structural aluminum, and then Haynes 282. Uh, and then in the works, we've also got a uh, stainless steel, uh, a 400 series stainless uh, aluminum 6061, um, potentially copper 18150, which is fairly similar to GRCOP 42. And then also uh, a little bit newer than these slides, a Haynes 214, um, we're starting to investigate as well. Uh, all the alloys that we have uh, produced or production ready uh, are up on our website as well. If you want to go download a data sheet, gives you the heat treats that we're using, again, some of those basic material properties, alloy information, all the uh, stuff that you might need to start investigating that a little bit further. 
and I'll pass it over to Jose. Good afternoon. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Drew. Uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Uh, uh, it is a pleasure to join you guys and to share some of the uh, progress we have made and the uh, incorporation of uh, 3D printing technology into the development of our uh, turbo machinery. Uh, Mohawk Innovative Technology is a turbo machinery development company. Uh, what we do is basically we uh, design and innovate on uh, the well understood field of turbo machinery. Uh, but bring it to uh, applications and uh, solutions that are currently essentially unavailable. And uh, what you see on the screen right now, uh, maybe I should say a little bit more about the company. The company was founded in 1994 by Dr. Hushan Heshman and a handful of associates. So uh, what characterizes our turbo machinery, what really is at the core of our systems is the use of the compliant uh, foil bearing. Uh, which is, loosely speaking, a kind of air bearing. Um, by air bearing, we should not be misled. Uh, our bearings actually use whatever the process fluid that the machinery is utilizing, thereby uh, eliminating the problem with uh, uh, sealing or containing uh, leaks of uh, lubricant uh, or interaction of lubricant with uh, process gases. So, for example, the uh, compressor you see on the screen is actually a supercritical uh, carbon dioxide compressor uh, designed uh, for uh, circulating, um, again, supercritical carbon dioxide uh, for an application in the solar um, uh, energy generation, clean energy industry. Uh, the idea is that the uh, solar uh, m mirrors uh, concentrate uh, heat onto a, a reservoir and the um, Supercritical carbon dioxide is used as a heat transfer fluid to transfer the heat uh, to the turbo machinery that then produces electricity. And for that, you need highly specialized um, compressors capable of tolerating the very stringent uh, conditions imposed by the extremely high pressures and temperatures associated with uh, supercritical fluids, specifically uh, carbon dioxide in this case. And so, just to close the thought, the Supercritical carbon dioxide is actually what lubricates and keeps our bearings, quote unquote, cool. Now, uh, imagine the challenge. Uh, this compressor that you see on the screen is supposed to handle approximately 25 uh, uh, megapascals of pressure at the inlet. Uh, that is 250 atmospheres. That is a very uh, difficult uh, uh, pressure to handle in general terms. But what complicates it further is that um, it, the, the gas is coming in at 550 degrees Celsius, which is uh, uh, an extremely aggressive temperature at those pressures particularly. Uh, so in the foreground, what you see is the um, uh, assembly. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a, a, magnet, a permanent magnet uh, motor coupled uh, to the actual compression um, item. Uh, to the actual compressor uh, impeller. Uh, that rotor goes, of course, inside that big housing you see. And uh, managing the uh, thrust imbalance caused by the enormous pressure differential between the inlet and the outlet of the compressor. Imagine even if the pressure ratio is very small. Say the pressure at the inlet is 25 megapascals and the pressure at the outlet is 26. You still have to deal with uh, megapascals worth of uh, uh, pressure pushing the shaft in one direction or the other. So that required a very clever uh, design of the housings uh, to sustain a series of seals that allow us to handle that pressure differential. Uh, so what we found is that I, I'm showing right here uh, the main housing the compressor impeller actually sits uh, in this location. This is what we would call, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can um, Drew, can you confirm that people can see my cursor? Or, um, see what? The, the cursor, cursor, if I point with my arrow. And we'll go ahead and move it. Yeah, no, maybe no. not. Can't, can't All right, so I'll, just, I'll describe with words. If you go to the bottom left, there's a little draw function. 
and you can get a oh, pointer yes, or you. a pen. Thank you. All right, perfect. There's a pointer. All right, can you see it now? Um, All right. Nope. All right, oh, yeah. oh, hang on. I see a cursor on the screen now. Yeah, I do see it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So I dropped two little arrows there by accident, but here we are. This is a cross section of this main housing. Uh, the compressor impeller sits uh, right here, and this is what you would call the inlet and outlet volute. Now, a, a bunch of seals sit back here, and uh, this, if you look at the thickness of that material, it's an incredible, it's an extremely thick material. And uh, because of the nature of the, uh, the, the corrosive and very chemi chemically active nature of the high pressure uh, supercritical carbon dioxide, high temperature, everything is working against a standard housing. So one of our few options for development of this housing was to uh, manufacture it out of a uh, uh, nickel-based super alloy. So um, this uh, launched us into a search for the proper manufacturing technique. And at Mighty, we were uh, uh, initially very reluctant uh, to use uh, 3D printing methods because of previous experiences we had, and we're talking about maybe 10 years ago, the technology was expensive and it was difficult to really know whether parts had any integrity. And that was until we uh, became acquainted with Velo uh, with their internal systems of diagnostics that uh, 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 their uh, Sapphire printers are um, equipped uh, gave us the confidence that it was something that we could try. And so um, the long story uh, made short is that fabricating this housing by traditional methods like casting and machining uh, proved out to be prohibitively expensive and time consuming. Uh, we looked for uh, many quotes from our normal vendors and then we went outside of our normal network of vendors we had m multiple no quotes because they thought the part was extremely complex. Uh, we had quotes for machining that uh, ended up on the order of more than $50,000 and potentially as much as uh, six months turnaround time. Basically, we uh, blow a hole through our budget and uh, throw our uh, uh, timeline. So we turned to Velo and uh, we started interacting initially with uh, um, um, Zach uh, Walton, um, and uh, he walked us through the uh, uh, capabilities of the uh, Velo technology, and we were convinced that we could give it a try. Uh, what was extremely attractive is that if you look at the uh, at the table on the left, uh, the price breakdown that he offered us. This, of course, just a, an initial estimate. Uh, the the actual price was a little different, uh, not not magnitude, more like, you know, the, the, the decimals. Uh, but compared to the $50,000 and more than six months uh, to develop versus uh, the two weeks that uh, uh, and $15,000 that they offered us, uh, we thought it was a no-brainer. So we did a little bit of due diligence on our end. Uh, we prepared a few. We asked uh, Matt to prepare a few uh, slugs of uh, Inconel 718 for us as a material of choice um, to uh, perform a few tensile tests just to convince ourselves that it would be able to handle the uh, pressure uh, inside. And uh, wow, the, the material su surprised us that it behaved essentially as well as uh, 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 bulk, uh, its bulk, bulk uh, counterpart, Inconel 718 a little stronger than castings, a little weaker than forgings, kind of right in between. And uh, we decided that we could go with it. And that launched our company basically into the uh, adoption of 3D printing uh, technology. This housing actually is now a part of a compressor that is undergoing testing in our uh, shop currently. And uh, we are about to um, uh, declared uh, success. Uh, we've passed all of our initial testing metrics and we're about to develop a full array of compressor maps and the system is behaving beautifully, largely enabled by the ability to develop this extremely complex part um, 
through 3D printing. Um, so this encouraged us to continue our march forward and uh, uh, start in introducing this into uh, other, uh, uh, the other branch of our main interest on, on uh, uh, our tur main tur current turbo machinery interest, which is the development of uh, uh, blowers to support the solid oxide fuel industry. So um, this is uh, supported largely by the Department of Energy, which has extremely ambitious goals for uh, implementation of um, commercial solid oxide fuel cells for clean energy and uh, distributed energy, essentially. Uh, so in collaboration with fuel cell energy, uh, we have been working for the last uh, approximately five years towards uh, developing the, some of the critical components for the balance of plant of a fuel cell. We have worked with heat exchangers, we have worked with blowers. Um, and uh, again, you hear the word blower and heat exchanger and you wonder, well, that, that's very well known uh, technology. What is the uh, uh, challenge? The fuel cell, the solid oxide fuel cell is a particularly uh, challenging uh, piece of equipment. Uh, it is very sensitive to chemical um, um, impurities, and it is also very, um, uh, it, it handles extremely aggressive corrosive gases. Uh, so uh, typical uh, blowers and compressors usually experience severe corrosion and uh, issues of hydrogen embrittlement of uh, uh, stainless steels. And uh, even the magnets in the motors uh, tend to degrade very rapidly. So um, we, again, come in with a technology that is capable of uh, interacting with these gases, largely because we do not have liquid or liquid lubricants or, or grease lubricants in our uh, system. And uh, because uh, we are very comfortable with the use of uh, uh, super alloys. And again, uh, the question is, is the challenge is to bring down the cost of manufacturing. Uh, what can we do? Well, um, the answer would be simple if uh, solid oxide fuel cells were being developed or rather uh, implemented by the thousands. But the reality is that right now um, the uh, market is still in a state of flux in a state of maturation. And what's happening is that uh, fuel cell integrators are currently experimenting with many uh, potential branches of technology and are really not set or ready to um, uh, request thousands or even hundreds of a particular blower design. So it becomes very difficult for us to manufacture the blowers at a reasonable cost when a customer comes and asks for, say, five units. Uh, so we can give them a, a, the benefit of, uh, uh, um, you know, mass production cost breakdown. And we cannot, at the same time, try to charge them at the cost of a handcrafted unit for every single one of them. So uh, mass production methods like casting are out of the question. And one-off methods like uh, uh, subtracting mach machining, say five axis uh, CNC machines are prohibitively expensive. And here's again where um, um, 3D printing comes to save us. The target cost of production for these blowers is expected to be about $110 per uh, kilowatt of solid oxide fuel cell uh, generated a kilowatt. And uh, that means, I'm going to skip this slide for right now, that uh, we have to control the cost of some of the most expensive components in the blower. And besides the actual permanent magnet uh, motor elements, the most expensive uh, component in the system is the impeller, uh, especially if it is made out of a super alloy like Inconel 718. Uh, for example, for the prototype in the corner right there, the impeller, the impeller alone costs 
upwards of uh, 15, uh, 16, according to the chart, $18,950. So imagine uh, if you want to make five of them and they are made one by one, and increment is very difficult to work with on a subtractive basis. We have to uh, uh, find the alternative. And as you can see, uh, here we have a price comparison. And these are actual prices after working with Velo and actually developing our first uh, batch of impellers. Look at the staggering uh, difference in cost, even for as few units as two at a time. Um, there are other benefits, of course, in addition to cost. Uh, if you consider the amount of material wasted when you uh, manufacture an impeller via subtractive methods. Uh, we are looking at starting with a solid ingot of, uh, or hockey puck shape of uh, super alloy to basically throw away approximately 80% of the uh, volume of the body as chips, as dust. So uh, once you start looking at all of these benefits, if you compound it with the fact that we can create extremely exotic geometries that are cost prohibitive on small to row machinery like the one we developed, uh, it's a no brainer. You really have to incorporate uh, 3D printing methodologies. So um, this is our um, first um, uh, project uh, with Velo. Uh, we are now, this is uh, in, again, in collaboration with the Department of Energy and again in uh, an effort to support solid oxide fuel cells. We now have a separate project with the Air Force for development of other uh, turbo machinery. Um, unfortunately, I cannot mention too much about it other than uh, we have even, uh, we have been leveraging the, the, the learnings from this project into the uh, next generation system. Uh, we have uh, been a part of VELO's um, uh, learning curve with the development of uh, impellers for turbo machinery. Uh, we started with a simple first trial to see if we could even approximate the shape to a satisfactory degree. And we were extremely surprised and pleased by uh, how close to a uh, final product the wheels were. They had some issues, uh, which uh, iteratively and in collaboration with the engineers at Velo, uh, my team at Mighty and the team at Velo, uh, really worked synergi synergistically uh, to uh, uh, basically give them give Velo feedback on where we needed to refine the, the the geometry, and Velo gave us feedback on essentially what kinds of limitations they were finding. Uh, the, the you know maybe our demands were too stringent, so we reached a compromise by the time of the third build, where uh, we tried uh, multiple approaches for supports and unsupported and thickened and uh, reduced counts, blade counts, et cetera. So here in, in the last build we have, uh, I'm gonna say there's uh, six different designs there that uh, um, we tried uh, in an effort to determine um, how well they were, uh, how ready they were for operation in, a, in an actual system. And here are the three evolu evolutionary steps in a closer view. Initially, the geometry was basically close, but very rough. Uh, as you can see, these uh, strange buildups at the edges will definitely destroy the aerodynamic uh, uh, efficiency of the impellers. And that was the first thing that uh, the Velo engineers resolved. By the next iteration, they had essentially eliminated that um, over buildup but we have problems with a uh, uh, level of blade sag. And again, you know, the iterative uh, um, information exchange that has to finally be uh, uh, reminiscent of cast uh, uh, impellers. They are as good as a casting. Um, and that is a tall order actually, because a casting you can have extremely tight geometric control. Just for reference, uh, the machine blades of course are extremely clean. Uh, you could argue that this bias uses uh, aerodynamic efficiency, but in reality, there are, uh, in turbo machinery of this scale, the influence of this rugosity is a secondary factor to, uh, for example, uh, secondary flows around the impeller tips. So uh, 
this uh, surface finish is more than acceptable. It's actually uh, great for what we need. And again, it's enabled over a course of, of a year of interaction with Velo. Um, here's a slightly closer view of uh, um, some, well, these are some of the design renderings. Um, this is, of course, how the plate looked before uh, some of the steps that have to be taken, the plate needs to be cut from the, or rather the, the parts are printed and they have to be stress relieved. And then, of course, we need to perform some uh, uh, secondary machining uh, operations. But as you can see, uh, we can come up with geometries that are extremely intricate and detailed. Uh, this is a covered impeller uh, or a shrouded impeller. These are usually made uh, in large scale, say for the petroleum or water industry, uh, but are too difficult or rather almost impossible for uh, small turbo machinery like this. And uh, again, Velo enabled us and we buy efficiency and uh, uh, we are extremely pleased by them. Uh, we have split impeller configurations. This, this uh, thickened blade version that we were just uh, basically see, uh, using to see uh, uh, geometric uh, control. And this is uh, ultimately the one that, we, this one and this one are the ones that we prefer for production. Um, these are uh, views of the uh, impellers as they undergo uh, the multiple uh, heat treatment processes required to bring the inconels from the 3D printed state to the fully hardened, uh, mechanically uh, optimal uh, material. Uh, they, as I said, they get cut from the plate, then they get stress relieved. Then they go through a process of uh, hot isostatic uh, pressing. Uh, and then they get submit, subjected to uh, standard heat treatment, uh, inconel heat treatment. And you can see the, the progression and the color variation is very attractive. Um, finally, uh, for them to be properly uh, aerodynamic components, there's a finished machining step. Uh, we need to uh, uh, remove the, uh, basically shape the base to create the pilot attachment point so that the uh, impeller can be mounted onto the shaft. And in the case of the shrouded impeller, we need to open its uh, lateral um, ex ex um, exit port. So, um, this is where we are right now. We are about ready to uh, mount uh, the impellers onto our blowers, and we expect to uh, start testing uh, of these units uh, potentially by the end of this month. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we will probably have uh, uh, updates shortly to tell you how well the uh, impellers performed, especially once we uh, push them to high speed and uh, the higher temperatures they're supposed to operate at. And with that, um, that's all I have. Is there any questions? Thank you very much again. All right. Thank you for such an informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. Um, so our first question is, is the hearth fit done with AM or machined after? Can, can you repeat the question, please? Is the what? Hearth. The hearth fit done with additive manufacturing or machined afterwards? It's, it's uh, uh, regarding my parts, the imp I, I, I'm, not, I'm not hearing the first word, I'm sorry. Earth, H-I-R-T-H, Earth. I think in, in general, um, any kind of like very tight fitments, um, interfaces, flanges, those are typically done with a post-machining operation. Um, so, like you'll see on some of the impellers that Jose showed, where 
they've uh, done a finished cut on the shroud. He mentioned that you, there wasn't a picture, but on the bottom side, they uh, did a machining operation on the bottom to make sure that that fit in their machine, their blower as well, clean off the top and then uh, board out the middle, which may be what that hertz is referring to. So yes, in general, uh -huh. for any kind of like tight tolerance um, interface type features, those are typically done with the machining operation. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I I I I, I see the the question written now. Um, yes, um, exactly what uh, Matt said. Uh, for the main the big housing that I showed at the beginning, uh, all of the uh, parts that mate with the uh, balance of the compressor, say the uh, the the machined parts, all of those surfaces have a cleanup path. Basically, uh, they came out of a, a heat treatment process. And even if the 3D printing is fairly accurate, remember that the 3D printing actually introduces, uh, sorry, the heat treatment introduces a small level of distortion. So regardless of how we make a part, even machine parts, if they are sub subjected to a heat treatment, there has to be a, f a finished machining pass uh, to make sure that the geometries uh, truly make with each, uh, with each, m match up with each other. Uh, anywhere where you see flanges, uh, in particular for our impellers, uh, yes, the ODs of all of the blades have undergone a machining pass. Uh, but more importantly, also the, the shrouding, uh, which is the, the, the basic, the, the shape that causes those blades in the volute is also uh, subjected to a final uh, machining pass. But Again, this is this would be a normal process regardless of whether it's a casting or a machine part. Um, what we have saved, of course, is the uh, uh, overhead cost up front of programming a CNC machine and hours and hours of a technician uh, removing all the material or the castings, which remain expensive until they really break down to uh, many. So. Um, despite the fact that we have to machine parts, uh, it's very cost effective. Okay, good. Another question here. Um, there might be another word in here, um, um, Jose. So did you have to use HIPing to get to the material properties needed? So it's capital HIP then ing. Yes. Did you have to, yes, you have, did you have to use that? Uh -huh, go ahead. Yes. Yes, it's a hot isostatic press process. And that mm -hmm. was uh, recommended by Velo, actually. Um, they developed the, pr the, the, the process, right? And they developed the material. And uh, they recommended that we submit, subjected everything to a HIP process before we subjected it to a, a, a heat treatment. And Matt may be able to uh, provide us a little more uh, clarity. But basically what we're looking for is the elimination of any potential uh, uh, porosity, as minuscule as it may be, and of any potential uh, gas inclusions, again, as minuscule as they may be. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, so it, I think the key to the question is material properties needed. So it all depends on what you need. Um, many people are using printed parts right out of the machine versus others are going through full-blown heat treat regimen. So uh, to Jose's point, um, the HIP process is trying to close down any remaining pores, and uh, it's a little bit controversial, but there's generally two major types of pores you'll find in printed parts. The first one's lack of fusion or areas where you haven't fully melted that powder, and so those pores will tend to be very sharp and um, I'll call them unfriendly that uh, tend to want to start cracks. And then the other kind you'll find are uh, spherical gas-filled porosity, um, which those in the, the welding world might be familiar with that as well. Um, so HIP, I guess our AM process generally tries to steer very far away from lack of fusion process and make sure we never have that. Um, on the other side, spherical gas porosity is um, still found, uh, usually around the surface in some different types of parameters. And so, HIP will try and close out all of those, assuming those pores are not surface connected. Um, and it's kind of no different than a casting, trying to hit pores out of a casting. But uh, if you go to HIP those pores, let's assume you're hipping a, a, a lack of fusion pore, 
you're likely going to close that down and make that a more friendly kind of uh, inclusion, if you will. When you go to try and hit a spherical gas filled pour, uh, there's debate out there whether or not you are improving the properties because you've now just taken a, a nice, I'll call it friendly, sphere uh, full of gas inside your metal and then squished it down to something that looks more like a crack. I'm not a materials expert not here to kind of answer that question, but just to put some thoughts in into folks' mind of what to think about when going through HIP. And then there's also the, especially with like Aikenel, there's a variety of other types of heat treatment, solution, aging, annealing you can do to tailor the printed part properties to what you actually need. Okay, good. All right, next question. Someone says here, I'm curious what pressure code was applied and how the AM process was qualified to meet the requirements for the supercritical CO2 housing? All right, that's a very good question. And uh, we do have probably an hour's worth of uh, material, which I thought was way too much for this presentation, maybe for a different occasion. But uh, we have done a huge uh, suite of tests by now on the Inconel 718. Uh, precisely because we keep pushing it past uh, just the static uh, pressure uh, problem to now the dynamic high-speed rotation, high-temperature rotation problem for turbo machinery. Uh, so uh, we have done, uh, of course, we did a, a chemical analysis to make sure that uh, we did uh, uh, pass the definition of the UMS standard uh, for what is Inconel 718. We did a crystallographic, metallographic study with a, uh, uh, electron diffraction scanning. Uh, we detected that the material actually develops the gamma double prime phase that is characteristic of properly hardened Inconel 718. We performed a tensile uh, tests to calculate or to derive the uh, modulus of elasticity and the ultimate and the yield stresses uh, for inconel printed in multiple directions and ori orientations, call them, you know, the horizontal print on the table, uh, the vertical print, and multiple in between angles. And we are currently in the middle of a, a long study funded partly by the Air Force and partly by the Department of Energy uh, to characterize the high frequency fatigue, high cycle fatigue and the creep characteristics at uh, multiple temperatures. Uh, the temperatures of interest for us uh, span all the way up to about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit or 871 Celsius, I believe is the conversion, which is typical of uh, microturbine uh, combustors. Um, and so basically we've done all of these tests uh, we just finished writing a, a paper that uh, will be shortly presented at IGTI in Rotterdam, uh, the ASME uh, Com uh, International Gas Turbine Institute, uh, ASME Turbo Expo 2022, and we will be presenting a paper there uh, on all our findings on these uh, mechanical properties for the 3D printed ink on it. Um, so okay. we've, we've done a lot of work. Uh, and again, because we could not trust blindly that the three printed material would just work, considering that we cannot even trust casting sometimes. So you know, uh, decades, hundreds, centuries of uh, uh, familiarity with uh, bulk materials, and we still have uh, uh, mechanical failures. We wanted to do due diligence with the three D printed material, and it's so far passing quite nicely. Very good. And um, now uh, next, we've got quite a lot of questions here, so I think we need to keep the answers short so we get through them all, um, because I'm sure you can talk at length on each one, but we've got a lot of questions coming in. Next one, on the supercritical CO2 application, what, was the po what were the post-processing steps after the build? Any steps for improving the surface finish on the flow path surfaces? Um, same thing as we described for the impellers. There's uh, definitely uh, for uh, the uh, the aerodynamic element of the volute, you know, where we have the the, the diffuser and the shrouding. Uh, there was a secondary finish machining via five-axis machining, 
and all of the parts that again connect flanges and seals and gaskets uh, were also machined. Uh, but the uh, surfaces that are not critical to motion or to assembly were left as they are. Uh, only subjected, of course, everything subjected to the HIP and heat treatment per the ASME and ASTM standards. Okay. Next one. Uh, can a broken or scalloped impeller be prepared without contacting the OEM? Not entirely sure what the question is there, but um, we have a network of contract manufacturers that run our Velo systems. And so they are all well versed in setting up builds, um, especially impellers. So uh, if you'd like to get in contact with one of them, uh, feel free to reach out to us or we can give you a list or um, I think they're on our website as well and, and they can help you. But we're glad to help um, directly as well. We don't charge for that kind of or, or kind of collaboration. We're happy to see our customers succeed. So feel free to reach out directly to us as well. Okay. I should just know. I'm sorry. I should just uh, nuance this with the uh, to to the user that may want an impeller that ultimately it is going to be your design that gets printed. Uh, in order to print someone else's design, I I don't know that there's an open library for that yet. <laughs> All right. Good. Another question: Do the printed parts have the same mechanical properties of the base material that come in other forms, such as forgings, bar, or sheet? I think to, Good question. Uh, Jose said it said it nicely. Um, they tend to fall between cast and forged, depending on heat treat. Uh, typically closer to forged, but uh, at the highest level, that's approximately where they're where they will fall. And again, we've got our data sheets on our website uh, for a little bit more specific information. All right. Next one. Um, how much is the rotational speed? of those impellers, do you do high-speed balance afterwards? Yes, uh, for the uh, supercritical, uh, sorry, for the, um, for the, the I'm sorry, a blower for the fuel cell. Uh, the speeds that we're operating are anywhere from 40,000 to 85,000 RPM. And uh, yes, we do very careful, uh, uh, low speed and trim balancing, we call it, at high speed. I've seen All people, right. depending on design, go 90, 100,000 plus RPMs with printed yes, parts. Yes, uh, well. for, for, for some other machinery, we're contemplating using uh, impellers probably as, as high speed as 250,000 RPM already. So, yes, it's in the works. Okay, good. Um, any perspective on blade vibration and fatigue on compressors made with AM versus other processes? I'll, I'll jump in on this one again. We are doing our due diligence and uh, uh, doing the measurements of high cycle fatigue. Uh, the behavior of the material uh, uh, high cycle fatigue seems to be again in line with what forgings and castings present. We, in our paper, we will have a uh, figure that compares an aggregation of data from multiple uh, providers of castings and forgings, like uh, uh, you know uh, your standard uh, vendors and our material, our 3D printed material, and everything is behaving right quite nicely. Now, a feature, a characteristic of the uh, compliant foil bearing based tool machinery is that we essentially have no vibration, so we're only doing this as due diligence. But uh, we don't expect to see any difference in behavior from the point of view of vibration between castings, forgings, or 3D printed material. Okay, good. Um, another question, how much work is required to balance the impellers? Um, it's a standard. Um, we, we have just, we finished balancing uh, four shafts in the last, uh, uh, I'm gonna say month. Uh, and they were not just one compressor wheel, they were an actual uh, micro turbine, which basically means that we have a turbine on a turbine wheel on one end and a compressor wheel on the other, both 3D printed. And it was not more difficult than uh, uh, with the uh, machined uh, versions. Again, remember that there's a, a secondary machining process to finish the uh, pilot fit and the OD, 
which basically brings the part very close to the final tolerance already. And the 3D printing we will only accept if uh, the internal features, for example, the hub shape and the relative thickness of the uh, blades is uniform. So um, yes, the, the parts essentially come very close to being balanced as well as a machine one. All right. Um, second last question here. Can Velo print a 15 to 20 micron layer thickness? Yeah, so uh, there's no physical reason why we couldn't. Uh, we've standardized all our processes to 50 microns today. A couple things to keep in mind going smaller than that is just productivity, how long it'll take to print your part, um, and then surface finish. So people tend to go smaller layers for better surface finish. Um, something to keep in mind there is the powder size. The size of the particles we're using as more or less feedstock is 15 to 45 microns. So when you're on the bottom end of that scale of actual powder particle size, um, you're going to hit a limit of kind of uh, improvements you can get from reducing layer thickness. So we, we try to balance the combination of um, throughput and overall like feature resolution and surface finish and have more or less just settled on 50 microns for now. We've done others, but um, our standard parameters are 50. Okay, good. I'm going to have to make this one the last question as we're running out of time. Do you think 3D printing of metals will be um, will only be used for specific complex parts, or will it eventually be used to manufacture many, many parts? What are the limitations to the 3D printing parts, certain shapes, sizes, time? Um, if I may um, do my opinion first, I, Matt will probably have something more interesting to say. But we are beginning to use 3D printing for everything. Our next family of uh, Department of Energy compressors for uh, solid oxide fuel cells, we're looking at 3D printing the uh, main housing, the end caps, the bearing housings, the volute, the impeller, and uh, the finned uh, heat dissipation housing. So pretty much everything is going to be 3D printed except for the shaft, uh, and the bearings at this point. Matt, do you yeah, want to add uh, anything to that? Sure. I think people shouldn't take 3D printing as a replacement of machining, casting, forging. It's, it's another tool in the toolbox, right? And there's scenarios where it makes a lot of sense to use 3D printing. There's scenarios where it makes no sense. So. Um, it's really, I think, a matter of getting the design engineers out there familiar with the technology, what it can and can't do, and when to apply it, and to apply it appropriately um, where it makes the most sense to get the most value out of the kind of manufacturing toolbox that exists today. Um, so, yes, I think it's going to be significantly widely more adopted as the technology grows. The sizes of envelopes that you can build in grow, the material selection grows, the throughput goes up. Um, but yeah, there's there's always a right place, right time for when to use what technology. All right, well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank the audience for attending and participating in today's event. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Velo3D, for making today's educational webcast possible. We'd like to ask everyone in the audience to participate in a brief survey. You can see the survey to the right of your screen. You will receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So thank you all for joining. We'll see you the next time. Goodbye. <laughs>